Hello YouTubers, Alaska Prepper here. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. We have already been taken over by the UN and I'm going to show you that. But first I have to take you through the journey that I've gone through and how I got to this. And I know this is a prepping channel, but information, in my opinion, is very important to preparedness because it allows you to see what's coming down the road. So please bear with me because I kind of feel sick to my stomach right now after taking a look at this and, and looking at it for myself. I've heard this through the grapevine here and there from other channels, but I just happened to come across this information by happenstance. I guess you can say that I went down the rabbit hole and I have no idea what's going to happen to this video. I don't know if it's going to trigger anything, but I'm going to go ahead and put it up anyways and we'll see what happens. Whatever happens, happens. I'm not that big of a channel where I think that YouTube will be worried about what I tell you all, what I found, and I will leave the link to everything that I show you here on a pinned comment. Right? So I don't think that YouTube's going to worry too much about my channel putting out this information because, like I said, I'm not that big of a channel. So I started my journey this morning thinking about natural gas. You know, thinking about what is it that the country, what is it that these companies want to accomplish besides greed by holding back on natural gas? And I found out that during yesterday's video or the video where I talked about that a community member sent me an email that her husband works for a major natural gas utility where they live. And they said that uh, in that email, I might have misread it, where it said that we only had about 6% of our reserves met well in the united states after my research right here it shows that we have probably about 10 to 12 years worth of natural gas in the ground but that we only have about 21 maybe 25 days worth of working natural gas meaning natural gas that they can get to and push out to consumers which is still in my opinion a very low number but that's what I was after is how can we have such a low stock of natural gas? And we do. We have a very low stock of available natural gas. And they're keeping it that way in order to be able to charge us more by only giving us what we need to consume instead of, instead of allowing local utilities to have a reserve of their own. That's what they're doing. So I'm looking through here. You know, I, I looked through here and I confirmed how much we use on a regular day and how much we have in the working stocks. I took a look and see how much we have right here. Like I verified the working stock, which as of, I believe, the 10th of June. So about two weeks ago, it was 2,095 billion cubic feet. Right. And we use about the U.S. uses about 65, 70 billion cubic feet per day. And uh, it might be million. I might be saying that wrong. But uh, we use about 65, 70 uh, million cubic foot, foot per day. And uh, we have about 2,000 in stock. So we have about 21 days or so. But you can look at these for yourselves. This is not the main point of this video. The main point of this video is that we have been taken over by the UN, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm going to show you exactly how. And I mean, you can look all of this information up for yourselves and take a look at how a foreign, non-elected governance party, whatever you want to call it, entity, whatever you want to call it, is pretty much controlling the entire world, but pretty much the United States. I'm worried about the United States. This is where I live. This is where my, my children live and will live after I'm gone. So after I take a look at all of this stuff here, I come up to this. And you've heard this before, and I've talked about this before right here. Environmental, social, and governance, ESG criteria. And just to give you a quick glimpse as to what ESG is, for those of you that may not have heard of this in the past, I'm just going to go over real quick what it says. What are ESG criteria? ESG criteria are a set of standards for a company's behavior used by socially conscious investors to screen potential investments. Environmental criteria consider how a company safeguards the environment, including corporate policies addressing climate change. For example, social criteria examines how it manages relationships with employees, suppliers, customers, and the communities where it operates. Governance deals with the company's leadership. 
executive pay, audits, internal controls, and shareholder rights. So pretty much ESG deals with pretty much everything that a company does. Well, why does that matter to us? Doesn't this sound good that a company should be looking out for the for for the environment, for the social causes where they where they um, uh, operate, and and then be governed by a a single entity that will enforce uh, whatever policies they want to enforce on them? Because this single entity is the one that came up with the ESG standards. So so I'm thinking to myself, yeah, but how are they going to enforce this? I haven't heard of any laws or anything like that where, where like our government, our Congress, our Senate has passed to enforce these criteria that it took me a while to find out where it came from. Because what they do is they change the name or they change the wording or acronym on it in order to make it very difficult for the average person to go and research. I, I spent about two hours looking at this stuff. I spent about two hours this morning looking through all this. I must have clicked on, I don't know, about 150 to 200 websites trying to find who is it that is in charge of setting the standard for ESG. Who is it that says, hey, this is what it's going to be. And you would think that if you live in a sovereign nation, meaning a nation that is over itself and does not have anything else, any other entity over it, you would think that it would be your federal government or your executive branch, you know, after any laws being passed by the House and the Senate that would sign these things into law. But no, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm asking myself, well, you know, who is it that's doing it then? And is this even enforceable? Is it even enforceable? So I came up to this right here. And because I typed in who enforces ESG? Well, now the SEC which is not an elected branch of government, right? It's an appointed branch of government. Enforcement related to ESG investing likely to increase in 2022. So now the SEC, the, Ex the Securities Exchange Commission, is now tasked with enforcing ESG policy. But who is it that is passing these policies? Who is it that comes up with these, these policies? Environmental, social, governance. Who? We don't know who. So here in the United States, we have one of our appointed branches of government, which we did not elect, enforcing policies that were not set forth by we the people through the House, the Senate, and then the executive branch. Ladies and gentlemen, this is very dangerous. And that's why I say that. This may not sound preparedness related, but it really is because it allows us to see what's happening in the background and how it will affect us in the future. And it will affect us in a huge way. I'm gonna finish this video off with how it will affect us in a huge way, ladies and gentlemen. Incredible. In March, 2021, the US Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, created a Climate and Environmental Social and Government Task Force, an ESG task force. But what law passed this? How did this pass into law? How was this voted on? Was this voted on by we the people via the Congress and then via the Senate? Within the Division of Enforcement, the purpose of which is to identify and investigate ESG-related violations. But if they are violations, they are violations of standards that were set by who? All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's where I'm getting at. We have been taken over by the UN, maybe not directly. They didn't, they didn't send any blue hats to take over our streets, but they've definitely taken over our nation. And I'm gonna show you how it is that they've taken over our nation. And now they have someone that can enforce their policies upon us, we the people, without us having had elected them to office. That's how big of a deal this is. So then I went over here to DuckDuckGo and I typed in ESG law passed by government, right? And I took out here, U.S. states taking ESG legislation into their own hands. So these ESG legislations haven't even been passed by our government. Now states are taking it into their own hands. So I click on this and it says U.S. states taking ESG legislation into their own hands. 
In the coming months, members of the New York State Legislature appear poised to pass the Fashion, Sustainability, and Social Accountability Act. You notice how they always make these laws or bills seem so very nice, just like the Patriot Act? The bill currently is making its way through the Senate State Assembly would require any company with more than $100 million in annual revenue that does business in the state of New York to disclose its supply chain, sustainability risks, and its plan to mitigate them. The Fashion Act, as it is also known, does this by requiring companies to identify their businesses' most critical climate and human rights impacts, and therefore the areas in which they have the most leverage to inspire positive change. But positive change for who? If passed, the bill will also require all large global fashion and apparel companies to map at least half of their supply chains by volume and disclose supplier names, significant tasks considering the sprawling complexity of the industry's global sourcing and production scene. So what they're doing here is, is they're making companies that make $100 million or more a year in revenue, all right? And I'm pretty sure that that number will continue to go down. It'll go down until everyone has to disclose where their supply chains come from, where their, where their supplies come from. And why is it that they want that? They want that to ensure that the people that they're doing business with are also adhering to the ESG policies. So if you're a company in New York State right now and this passes, if you make over $100 million in revenue a year, which it sounds like a lot, ladies and gentlemen, but it's really not that much for, for a medium-sized company, let's say. If it's found that you're doing business with other companies, even if they're overseas companies, that's why this is being taken over the world, not just the U.S. Even overseas companies, if it's found that their ESG score is below a certain amount, then you lose ESG credits as well on your score. It's a monitoring system in order to make companies do what an entity that was not elected into power want them to do. And I'm gonna show you how that applies to the US pretty much completely. So then I went over here. I took a look at this website, the top 10 natural gas companies in the U.S. market. And I'm only going to do a few, ladies and gentlemen, but you can do this for yourselves. I'll leave the links. So I was, you know, obviously, remember I told you in the beginning that I was researching natural gas and stuff like that. So I came in the top 10 natural gas companies in the U.S. market. Okay, great. So what I did was I just went ahead and I copied their name. And then I went to this website right here. Sense Folio, browse through the companies. And these are all companies that are part of ESG. All right. So I go ahead and I put their name in here to see if this company is part of ESG. And of course it is, ExxonMobil Corporation. And then you click on this. And it brings you to their ESG score. You can see here that the ExxonMobil Corporation has an ESG score of 43. And that's with every company, ladies and gentlemen. Let me go ahead and bring you back real quick so you can see something. Look at all of these North American companies that are ESG. We have been taken over by a foreign entity that was not elected by us, we the people. And they are now telling our companies what they have to do making them do this and that which affect us in the long run their goal is to price us out of the energy market let me show you one more that way you can see that it's not just by happenstance let's go ahead and just pick one that's i don't know i've never even heard of this company so let's go ahead and pick this one and put it in there and see if it's in there because you see these companies now if they want to do business they better get on board with ESG. They better get on board, ladies and gentlemen. And Southwestern Energy Company's ESG score, 53. So my point is that all of these companies, and these were just energy companies, they are all falling in line with ESG. And what is ESG? It is a plan that was set forth for the world by the UN, and now it is imposing that plan upon the world using the governments of those sovereign countries or unelected branches of the government to enforce their rules on us, we the people, starting with corporations 
and then they'll work themselves down to small businesses and then to the actual person. This is how it always works, ladies and gentlemen. You know how they say that trickle-down economics doesn't work? Well, this kind of trickle-down does work because it is the frog in boiling water. They start with the really large corporations, then they'll bring it down to the middle-sized businesses, then to the small mom-and-pop shops, and then eventually to you, the people. It's just like taxes. Remember back when the, the, the tax, the amendment on taxes was enacted? I think it was the 16th Amendment, I think. It started with just taxing like 1% or 2% to the very wealthy. And ladies and gentlemen, do you pay 1% or 2% taxes and are you very wealthy? No, you pay a lot more and you're not wealthy. All right, so check this out. This is the second thing I'm going to show you here. The next thing I'm going to show you here. How ESG relates with UN Sustainable Development Goals. This is where we get to who is in charge of ESG and then who is in charge of these companies? Because the, if these companies don't adhere to ESG policies, they'll have a low credit rating, ESG credit rating, and then other companies won't want to interact with them because they have such a low rating, which will hurt their rating. Guilty by association, right? This is the important part right here. Please pay attention to this. And then again, please do your own research. Addressing ESG factors can help organizations manage the environmental and social imprints and determine their business risks and opportunities. In addition, listen, the United Nations SDG Sustainable Development Goals are increasingly being recognized as a beneficial framework for responsible investment as the business world shifts its focus more intensely on ESG. ESG is SDG, all right? ESG is SDG. It is what the UN wants you to do, but they call it SDG, and then they change the name for businesses and corporations to ESG. To meet increasing stakeholder demand, some businesses are moving beyond standard ESG approach and are based on SDGs which offer a realistic framework for ESG mapping at a higher level and can help to increase the adoption of sustainable investment, encourage responsible corporate behavior, and integrate sector and business specific ESG factors with broader social issues and global environmental goals. Long-term value development for business and society is the goal of ESG-based investment decisions. This is a natural fit with the SDGs, which were founded on globally shared values. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all different. All nations are different. They were founded on globally shared values, according to who? Who voted on this? Social expectations and sustainable and inclusive approach to economic growth and well-being. SDGs are, go are global goals set out by the United Nations. SDGs are global goals set out by the United Nations. Whereas ESG is a rating system used by companies to measure their environmental and social credentials. Why are they measuring their environmental and social credentials? They're the United Nations. They do not govern the world, but it seems to me now that they do. Let me read that one more time. SDGs are global goals set out by the United Nations, whereas ESG is a rating system used by companies to measure their environmental and social credentials. Where's the G? Where's the governance? Well, that belongs to the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm going to finish it off with this because I really don't want to make this video too long because I don't want to lose you all. Now, this is an article that was published back in 2019. The Green New Deal, e Economics and Policy Analytics. I'm going to go down here and I'm going to read this part for you. A Green New Deal policy would yield no benefits in its central energy, environment, and climate context. But it would impose very large economic costs. But why? Why, ladies and gentlemen, isn't the Green New Deal supposed to be to save the earth? L listen to this. I'm going to read this again because it's important you understand this. It's saying here that the Green New Deal policy would yield no benefits 
it's in its central energy, environment, and climate context, but would impose a very large economic cost. Why would they want to use the Green New Deal as a cover to make your standard of living lower, meaning that it's going to cost you more to live? All right, we're going to get to that. Simple correlations among variables do not demonstrate causation, but the historical data on energy consumption and production, growth in gross domestic product, employment, rising incomes, and energy consumption and poverty make it clear that the Green New Deal would yield large adverse effects in each of those dimensions. So the Green New Deal would deal re, uh, large adverse effects in energy consumption, and production, growth and gross domestic product, meaning that, that our standard of living is going to go down, or lower gross, gross domestic product, employment, more unemployment, rising incomes, it will have an adverse effects on rising incomes, we're going to be poor, and energy consumption, and poverty. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you understand? They want to make the world equal. They want to make the world equal. And if you live in a first world nation, as we do here in the United States and a lot of other Western nations, they want to bring your standard of living down so that everyone's standard of living across the world is equal. What does that mean to you? It means that your standard of living is going to dramatically drop. And they're going to do that how? By making it impossible for you to earn enough with your labor so that you can live, so that you can maintain your standard of living. That is what we are up against. The electricity component of the Green New Deal is the least ambiguous. A highly conservative estimate of the aggregate cost of that set of policies alone would be $490 billion per year permanently, permanently, or an additional $3,800 per year per household. That means that your cost of living is going to continue to go up every year. Every single year, your cost of living will go up and until it gets to the point where your standard of living, where our standard of living is equal across the world. And this says uh, an impact that would vary considerably across the states if the Green New Deal were financed through electricity rates rather than a federal budget. Under such a rate payer finance assumption, the lowest household cost of $220 per year would be observed in Vermont. The highest would be observed in Wyoming at $17,000 per year. See, ladies and gentlemen, they want to make everyone equal. So it doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how many hours you put in. Your standard of living is going to be the same as your neighbors. That's how I read it. I'm going to go ahead and leave all of these links for you to take a look at. I know I'm not even going to bother with the comments. I know. Go ahead. Yeah, you're crazy. Well, do your own research. Do your own research and ask yourself, why is it that in the United States, where we have an abundance of natural gas, natural gas prices are spiking? And when, when we had one of our exporting uh, terminals catch on fire and we couldn't export anymore, that made our prices go down. Why in the world did it make the prices of natural gas go down when an exporting terminal, I believe it's in Texas, burned up? The reason is, is because we can now not export that gas and we have more here in the u.s that's why the prices of natural gas went down but they're exporting away everything that we have and leaving our working our working reserve in shambles with only about a three-week supply and then keeping our rates up but why are they keeping our rates up because i guarantee you one thing ladies and gentlemen the company that is in charge of these natural gas or, or the companies that make up our natural gas industry, I guarantee you they're part of ESG. And their goal is to make us all equally poor.